Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We're excited you guys are here with us today. We're excited everybody who is joining us online. This is a very special day today because throughout this service, we as a church are going to participate in two of the most ancient, most important, uh, holiest rituals that we have as the, the Christian people of God. And so at the end of the service today, uh, Joel's going to lead us through communion, and we're going to do that together in the Eucharist. And here in the next song, we have three people from this church community that are going to get baptized. All right? And so, uh, you know, those of you who have been around and you've been a part of something like this with the church, you understand that baptism is one of the, the most beautiful things that we get to watch, that we get to see. To be baptized is to uh, dramatically enact with your body the story of God what God has done in redemptive history, what God has done with us as individuals, what God has done with us as people. Uh, the story of scripture is the story that is embodied in something like baptism. And so I think it's important for the church to understand when we watch something like this, what exactly it is that we're witnessing when people go under the water and then they come through the water and, and we all cheer. And in order to do that, we look back at the scriptures and we tell the story, at least part of the story. Of, of the scriptures. And so you go all the way back to Exodus and Exodus was this moment in the history of the people of God where they are in bondage and slavery, oppressed by the most powerful empire that the world has ever seen, Egypt. And in that moment, God hears their cry. He sees them enslaved and he reaches into history, into the world and he delivers his people from slavery and bondage. And in the climactic moment, the people of God are being freed from slavery and they come to the edge of, of the waters, the Red Sea, and God parts the waters and the people of God go through the waters and, he, and they're redeemed. Through the waters, they're redeemed by God. And they come to the other side and God looks at them and he says, you are my people and I am your God. And so through the waters, they're claimed by God to be his. And then he says, you will be for me a nation of holy priests, which means a nation of people that are set apart, people whose lives reflect me to such a degree that the world looks at you and they see me, they see God in your life. And so through the waters, they're redeemed and through the waters, they're claimed and through the waters, they're commissioned to be the people of God in this world. And this moment is the moment that the nation of Israel defines themselves by for the rest of the scriptures. You, you see this over and over. Whenever God speaks, he says, I am the God who delivered you from Egypt, like on the wings of eagles through the Red Sea, parted the waters and delivered you. This is who you are. You are Exodus people. And so they're given a meal called the Passover. And every year they celebrate the Passover. And the Passover is in remembrance of this Exodus story to remind the people who their God is. He is a God who delivers. He is a God who delivered us from slavery in Egypt. And you go forward a thousand years and the people of God find themselves in a similar situation during the ministry of Jesus. They are now under oppression from another very powerful empire, Rome, once again. And the Passover becomes this meal where they look back at the Exodus where they were delivered from Egypt and they look forward to being delivered again. And Jesus comes along and he starts to talk about the fact that while they are under the thumb of a powerful human empire, they are also enslaved to the powers of sin and darkness and evil and ultimately death. And so Jesus gathers his disciples and Joel's gonna talk about this more when he leads us in communion. He takes them to an upper room on the weekend of Passover and he has the Passover meal with them, the Last Supper. And in that moment, he reconstitutes the story of the Exodus around himself. He says that the Israelites, we've been delivered from slavery in Egypt, and in what I'm about to do, in my actions, in my, in my death and resurrection, we will be delivered again. And the Last Supper becomes the, the Passover meal of the, the, the future Christians. So they have this meal together. Jesus goes into Jerusalem. He gets put on a cross. And on the cross, the powers of sin and evil and darkness and ultimately death overcome him. And he becomes overwhelmed by them just like you and I are. And he suffers the consequences of, of sin and evil and he dies. And then three days later, he raises again to resurrection life. 
and he defeats the powers of sin and evil and darkness because if death cannot hold Jesus, then nothing can hold Jesus. There is nothing that can defeat him if it's not death. And so here he is, free, through the other side. And he tells his disciples in his resurrected body that their job is now to go and to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 6, Paul says that when you go under the waters of baptism, you are reenacting the story of the new Exodus. You go underneath the water and you die with Christ. You are bound to him. You are, you are united with Jesus. You die his death on Good Friday and then you come out of the water on Easter Sunday, raised to new life with Christ. What's true of Christ is now true of you. And we reenact that in the waters of baptism. And so we go under the water and we come through the water into redemption, freed from our sins, forgiven, reconstituted. We come through the waters and we're claimed by God, adopted as sons and daughters of God and we come through the water and we are recommissioned to be the light of the world. It's what we write on our walls. We are the light of the world. And what that means is exactly what it sounds like, that our lives as Christians who have been, who have given our life to Christ, given our allegiance to Christ and have come through the waters of baptism, our life is now a reflection of God to the world. So they look at us as the church and they see God. We are redeemed we are reclaimed and we are recommissioned in the waters of baptism. And so we're about to watch three people reenact this with their bodies, this truth, that this is who we are. This is who the church is. And as the church, we stand and we celebrate. And when they come out of the water, we cheer because we are not just watching somebody get saved. We're watching somebody embody what it is to be a Christian. The story of the scriptures in one ceremony And we watch these people do this, and we as the church are responsible for them now. They are a part of the body. They come into the faith, bound to Jesus. And so we watch this baptism and we celebrate. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna stand up. We are going to be led in worship, and we are going to watch members of our community get baptized and embody the story of the scriptures, and we are gonna cheer and we are gonna celebrate. And so prepare your hearts to rejoice and prepare your hearts to be thankful for the amazing thing that we are about to be a part of. I'm super glad you guys are here today, and uh, what an amazing experience to watch people, you know, publicly give their lives to Christ. Um, Man, I mean, if you don't think this thing can change you, and you don't believe that God has this totally new direction for your life, it's it's kind of impossible not to be at least moved by someone who's willing to, to do that, you know? I mean, it's kind of a bizarre thing to do, to like get in that rubber made tub and get into the water that that's a lot to do and it means a lot um 
So if there's anybody else who ever wants to get baptized, like we already had four or five people get signed, signed up for that um, after last service, and we'd love to have a conversation with you about what that all means and what it can look like for you. We'd, we'd love to do that. Um, John just talked about the beginning, and if you're thinking about doing that, and you're thinking about six weeks, and that's a lot of time, uh, I want you to heavily consider going through that course. The reason that it's six days is because it's so good that after the sixth day you need to rest <laughs> and celebrate the creation that John has because the things that John is gonna teach you in the beginning, the, the narrative of scripture and the information, it, you know, John, John is not gonna tell you something that hasn't been said before or hasn't been learned before or taught before, but here's the thing about why I think you should take the beginning, is John, uh, his take on how that all plays out and his ability to teach it is exceptional. John is a very gifted communicator. So it's not, it's not just what he's talking about, but the way that he lays out the narrative that will, for any person, if you're new to the faith, if you, you know, if reading the Bible is intimidating, which it so is, if you just wanna understand the big picture, you need to do this. I mean, I, I've grown up in church and I've, I've went to four different schools of higher education for seminary, for Bible, for theology, and John is one of the best teachers I've ever heard in, ter in terms of teaching the Bible. So even if like you have a degree in the Bible, I would consider coming and listening to John teach the narrative because it's really, really helpful to understand it the way he teaches it. So uh, if it's new for you, I mean, to understand the whole narrative and how you fit into it and what God is up to, the way that he teaches, it's a transformative process that you go through. So please do that. That really is like the first offering that our church has that is beyond kind of the Sunday morning experience for young adults and above. I mean, as we start to gather together and more people are here, th that's one of those opportunities. So you should take the time to do that. We're gonna move into a time of communion. Raise your hand if you've ever been to church and taken communion before. Communion is a very special time for Christ followers to have a moment where they uh, like think about, pray about uh, their relationship with God, maybe reconnect with God, um, understand the dynamic of their relationship with God, how that relationship exists, what made that relationship happen. And communion is an opportunity for you to really move into a space of worship, of a moment of worship, of adoration, of thankfulness to God, and of a life that kind of moves from communion into more worship, living your life as you worship God. And the Bible teaches that it really is something for people who follow Christ. So when you think about today, you know, baptism is something that typically you do when you're, you're starting out on that journey. You know, you want to follow Christ and you're going to start to become a follower of him. And so baptism is the representation of that. And then as you move into that relationship with Christ, communion is something that Jesus says as often as you, as you do this, do it in remembrance of what I do for you who I am to you, it's an opportunity to connect with God. Jesus says in uh, some of the gospel narratives about the Last Supper, that Passover meal that he had with his disciples, he says, I've desired, I, I just waited to, uh, eagerly anticipating having this communion, having this Passover with you. And that's the first part of communion, is Jesus makes that moment about you, about you a relationship with you. He really wants to have a connection with you, individually. Jesus is a servant. At the Last Supper, Jesus does this remarkable thing. And in the book of John, it's one of the highlights, if not one of the climaxes of the entire book of John is when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He, he takes on the literal form of a servant and washes his disciples' feet, uh, which was normal in that time if you were to go to a place like that and have a meal like that because you're walking around in the dust and the dirt, 
the feces, like seriously, like literally it was something that the lowest of the low people would do because it was a really dirty job. Um, and Jesus, he, he does that. So he's serving us. And so communion is about him going, I, I love you. I wanna serve you. I want a relationship with you. And this meal, what it's meant for so long, I wanna do something with this meal so that what God started thousands of years ago and did a thousand years ago, that we can make sure that it doesn't lose its meaning, but that it continues to gain a holistic meaning. And he takes something that already mattered so much, the Exodus story, and he brings it into the future. And something that they've spent hundreds of years thinking about what God did, Jesus in that moment takes that monumental experience in all of human history and now he makes it about what he's going to do for them in the future. So I want you to think about this. If you're sitting with these disciples, they've all grown up celebrating Passover because they're so grateful for what God did when they were delivered from the Exodus. Well, they're in Jerusalem during this tumultuous time because there is oppression and uh, occupation from the Romans. And so they kind of feel like what happened in the past needs to happen again. And what Jesus does is he says, I'm not only going to deliver you from these people, I'm going to deliver you from something greater and I'm gonna do it in the next two days. And then what I do in the next two days is gonna be something that you'll look back on so that you have hope for your ultimate future. It's an amazing moment. It's a very bold moment for Jesus to say, take this bread, take this cup. And what it was thought of in the past, now I want you to use it to think of me. You don't say that unless you are someone of great significance. You don't take one of the greatest traditions in all of their history and say that Passover, that Exodus that happened, now it's about something I'm gonna do for you and I want you to remember the thing that I do for you for the rest of your life. You don't say that unless what you're about to do is as monumental as perhaps the greatest human experience that ever happened up until that time, the, the Exodus, the Red Sea crossing. So Jesus is about to do something that's so big, so exciting. It's unbelievable. It's monumental, the gravity of that moment. And what those things meant, he changes what they mean. The reason that we do uh, eat unleavened bread is because it doesn't rise. And so it's like the bread gets cooked faster. And there's this idea that they need to hastily, quickly leave slavery. You know, you need to get out of that place. Get out of there. Get out of Egypt. Move out of there quick. They had that herbs at the, at the meal because it represented the bitterness of slavery. And they were reminded of that. And they drink that wine because the, the only way they got out was that final plague where the blood of an animal was painted over the doors of those that the spirit of death would pass over. And if you didn't have the blood, then death entered the house. And so as they sit there, they remember those things, the bitterness of slavery, the, the need to get out of that oppression quickly, the blood that delivered them from death. And he's going, now all those things, I'm gonna embody that for you. So instead of thinking of it this way, take this bread and think of it as my body that is broken for you. Take, take this cup and think of it as my blood that is shed for you. But Jesus' move into the city of Jerusalem during the Passover is not just kind of uh, kind of like an accident, like he's just kind of around that region. There's multiple different uh, festivals throughout the year in Jerusalem. And Jesus specifically goes to Jerusalem at the Passover because the Passover and the Exodus is more than just something that you think about on an individual level. The theological significance of Passover is bigger than maybe another one of the festivals that they celebrate, like the Day of Atonement, which is a day that they take an animal and they sacrifice that animal and the blood of the animal covers the sins. What Jesus is doing does atone for sins, 
But it does even more than that. It, it defeats death. It overcomes the powers and the forces of death in the world. It doesn't just cover your sins individually. It covers the whole problem. It starts this idea of an entire nation being reoriented, reconciled, and moved into a new direction. Not just an individual, but everybody. So he goes to the Passover because he wants everyone to see the thing I'm about to do on the cross is as big as what you've been celebrating, but even bigger than that. And nothing else was as big as the Exodus until Jesus went to the cross, died, and rose from the dead. So the Exodus is kind of an interesting thing. It, it shows us a deliverance from kind of systemic problems, kind of systems of injustice and the way that the world becomes evil and nations become evil. And then the nation of, of Israel, they get out of slavery and they end up in the wilderness and then they end up in a promised land and then, and then even in the land of Israel that God had promised them, instead of them being kind of enslaved in a foreign land, they get enslaved to foreign idols in their homeland. And because of that, they have to leave the promised land. So this is kind of what happens leading up to Jesus going to this Passover. The nation gets brought out of a foreign nation to get their land. Then we get our land, or the Jewish people got their land, and they bring sin in the camp, and because of that, they lose their land. And so what you have is you have a picture with those two ideas, the exile and the exodus. You have a picture of all the things that God took care of on the cross. The macro problems of the systems of injustice in the world and all the death that people experience. And then the individual problems, the interior. That was the problem with the exile. They were at home, but they were worshiping false gods. And they lost their way from the inside out and not just from the outside in. And so every single one of us, when we come to the Passover, we have to understand that the reason that he says, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you is because of what he wants to do for you, all of us on a broad scale, and what he wants to do for you on an individual level. He wants to deliver you from death, ultimate death. He wants to deliver you from sin, the iniquities, the problems that we have inside, the things that we do where we worship false gods. And so as Jesus sits with his disciples just to bring this all home, it becomes a very individual interaction because he's sitting with these 12. And oftentimes we forget the need to come to communion. You know, one of the things about communion and the Exodus narrative is when they get delivered from slavery, it's not just that they're delivered from oppression. They're actually brought into a place of freedom where they can now worship God. You see, while they were in slavery, they weren't worshiping God. And so he's delivering them from the bondage so they can go, and they, you know, they go in, they get the law, which is basically a way of God making a nation and giving them guidance and giving them a way to be the kind of people of God that he wants them to be and have this system of interacting with God. The climax of the book of Exodus is not the law. It's the temple. It's the temple that gets built where God, remember this whole series I just did, where God and man can now be closer together because heaven and earth are coming back together. That's the whole point. The whole point of being brought out of something bad is to be moved into a healthy, wonderful relationship with God. That's the point. So what we have is Jesus sitting at the Passover and it's an opportunity for every single person there to worship Jesus. It's an opportunity, come, come back. Come out of that thing you're in that's causing that problem in your life. Come out of that lust, that passion, that desire inside of you that's evil and twisted and it's stepping away from the path of God in your life where you, you might not know but you're worshiping a false God. He says, take this bread, take this blood. This is your pathway to worship me. This is your pathway out of sin and death. This is it, and I want it for you. And sometimes when we think about, wow, he, 
deliver them from slavery. I mean, is that, we're not, I'm not in slavery. We're not in slavery like that. That, that is a spiritual kind of metaphor. It's like, okay, we don't necessarily need that part. And okay, the, the interior part where my sins and my problems, that, that resonates a little bit more with me. I know I have some problems. But Jesus dying for me, do I really need that? Am I really that guilty? Do I really need the Savior to die for me? Does he need to die that way? All those questions start to, to kind of bubble up. And we may not understand it fully. And we may not think that we're in need of what Jesus is about to do on the cross. And that's similar to what the disciples thought. I mean, they, 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 they knew he was starting his kingdom. But think about the narrative that you just read. There's two main characters that basically are the ones who are guilty of turning on Jesus in this narrative more than anyone. And they both say that they won't. The first one, Judas, remember the narrative? One of you is going to betray me. And then all of them say, well, it isn't me. They all say, it could, not me, surely it's not me. So they all think that it's not them, and none of them say it's him. So none of them think that Judas is a bad guy. They think that Judas is one of them. And then he says, it's the guy who I connect with during this moment when I'm taking the bread, the wine, whatever. He puts his hand in, and Judas is surprised. He goes, not me. Surely you don't mean me. Surely not me. Could it be that Judas's sin, maybe we've kind of marked him as just the obvious betrayer of God, when in fact, the night that he betrayed him, maybe he hadn't even fully made up his mind yet. Maybe he just thought, I'm going, and maybe he had something in the back of his mind, and maybe just one thing led to the next. Have you ever been on the journey, right? You're trying to stay faithful to God, and then just in a, a step, And so you might go, that's not me. Surely not me. And then he's like, it's you. What? It's me? And then he leaves and it's him. Suddenly doing the thing he never thought he would do. We all need redemption. And then they go out into the, to the garden and they have this conversation. They're singing. I mean, it's wild. And then... He tells them people are gonna betray him and disown him. Peter, right? Peter gets a bad rap because it's kind of interesting. The narrative. I'll never disown you, he says. Oh, he's Peter. Dude, you, you are gonna disown me three times before the end of the night. And he says, I will never disown you. And did you read what it said? Did you read it? I had you read it. Peter says, I'll never disown you. And then what does it say? No, and then it says, and so did everyone else. Right? So Peter goes, I'm not, I'm not gonna disown you. I'm not gonna turn my back on you, God. I'm gonna stay with you. I'll even die with you. Andrew, James, Bartholomew, Matthew, they all go, yeah, I'll die with you. I will too. That's all of us. None of us. None of us are gonna do it, right? We're not gonna turn our back on Jesus. We're not gonna do that. No way. Nuh-uh, not me. No, I'm not gonna do that. Then the guards come. What happens? What happens when the guards come to arrest Jesus? They all run. Who's the one that fights? Peter. So at least he's trying. So you and I might be like the ones that run, and it's like, okay, you definitely need this Passover. But then Peter, he at least fights, right? And then what does he do? Jesus gets arrested and taken through the process. Who's there? Peter, looking in, watching. He wants to follow God. He wants to, to be trapped in that thing. He wants to stay faithful. He's proximate. He's warming by the fire and Jesus is under trial and he gets asked, weren't you one of the Galileans that's with him? And he's there and he can't help. He says, no. We give him such a bad rap for saying no. He's the only one there. He still says no. The best of them get close but fall short. We all need communion, don't we? Because of what God's doing on the cross, because of where he's headed, because of what he's done that brings us into the promised land, that, that's where we're headed. 
a new scenario where death is destroyed, exodus, sin, iniquity is erased, the exile, the body broken, the blood shed. He wants that with you. He's offering it to you. And so as you take this cup that we gave you, if you didn't get one when you come in, came in, they're out there. We want you to take that and, and Lori's gonna come and sing after I pray. And I just want you to take a moment. I want you to open it up and uh, I want you to take that bread and I want you to ask God to forgive you of your sin. And I want you to think about bread that way, that, that kind of like unleavened bread that doesn't rise, that cooks fast. And think about running away from your sin. And I want you to identify the thing you need to run away from. And, and, and start running from it in your mind. Start running from it. Eat the bread and think, I'm running from that. And then you're gonna take that, that blood and, and that blood, that, that wine that represents that blood, you know what that is? The spotless lamb of God whose blood is shed, the perfect Son of God, who lets his blood be spilled to the ground in an atoning way to cover and wash. This is a moment where you thank the Lord. You adore him. You worship him. You thank him. You worship him. You speak to him in your prayer before you drink that, you say his name. You ask for forgiveness. You identify with Judas. You identify with the 12. You identify with Peter. And you say, please, please forgive me. Thank you for this sacrifice. So as Lori sings, we're just gonna sit. You can pray and take those two elements at any time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for taking this moment and building on it and offering it not just to, to those in the past, but to us now. We love you, we worship you, we thank you for giving us yourself. We thank you for your body being broken. We thank you for your blood being shed. Help us be quick to run from the things that destroy us. Help us to be humble and thankful for your blood that was shed in Jesus' name.